Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Friends, I, I got to begin this hour congratulating Philip, who handles all the digital. He's a, a official title as director of digital uh, for the syndicated side of my program, and I've got to congratulate him. Uh, Tennessee right now has a winning football season. It's not going to last. It's all downhill from here. But they start on a high note, so I feel the need to congratulate him and all the Tennessee fans in America right now. I watched that game last night. <laughs> all right, we must move on. I want to take your phone calls, 877-973-7425. It is the Eric Erickson Show. Before I do that, we got to talk about a cult. I have been talking to you now more than most in talk radio have about Jackson, Mississippi. I have family uh, who live near there, but not in Jackson, Mississippi. It has become a national story. Democrats can't capitalize on it like they've capitalized on the um, the on the Flint, Michigan story because Mississippi isn't really a swing state. It, you're not going to galvanize people into voting for Democrats at the state level and flip that state. So the media has largely ignored it, but it is a national story. The city of Jackson, Mississippi has for years failed to maintain and upgrade their infrastructure. And their city water sewer system has collapsed. Essentially, one of the problems is that their stormwater and sewage system were connected, and so if you get a big rain there, you can flush sewage out into the rivers, but also uh, you, the lines crack and you get harmful contaminants into the fresh water supply that's flowing to houses under pressure. You know, you, you look at a fire hydrant, when the fire hydrant flows, that's the pressure within the water main system. And then there are pressure regulators at your house, so your house doesn't get all that pressure. I wish my house had higher pressure. Um, I, so yeah, I, I would love one day to be able to, to have a place up at Lake Burton in North Georgia. Those of you not in Georgia, a beautiful part of the state of Georgia. Uh, it's the, the highest of the, the damned lakes for Georgia power for power. Uh, it's up in Northeast Georgia in the mountains. And I stayed, so there's this, uh, golf club up there called the Waterfalls. It's Nick Saban from, yes, I know that that's Saban. Uh, he's one of the owners up there. And a couple of years ago, I was going through a, well, I was going through a rough patch. My wife and sister needed to get out of town, and I was able to stay in. They've got these villas, condos. I would love to have one. It was on. It was high up. You could look down the mountain at the lake. It was right next to the the golf club, so you go over and grab something to eat. And the shower in this in this condo, this villa, whatever they call it, it had like nine or twelve shower heads. It's like walking into a car wash. You had them from the bottom, from the middle, from the top, one straight over you, two others, a handheld, and the water pressure was unbelievable. My buddy Vince Longo is a home builder in Atlanta. I'm like, Vince, one day you're going to build my house, and you are going to put in like the, a, a billion shower heads. I want to just stand there, my arms outstretched, and have the water it be so powerful, so much water pressure just takes the skin off. That's what I want in a shower. I want massive water pressure, unlimited heat. I want the little option to turn it into a steam room like this shower head. I had never been in a shower like that before. I would love to go back to that place and they don't let people stay there anymore. I, I, I would love to have a place like that. I want a shower like that. Problem is, if I lived in Jackson, Mississippi, I couldn't because the mere fact that I needed the high water pressure, it would explode the water system in the neighborhood. The water system in Jackson, Mississippi is decrepit. It is antiquated. They cannot run it as a pressurized system because it will break, which puts fire, causes a fire hazard. Because the water uh, fire hydrants, you can't run them at adequate pressure. 
it's allowing contaminants into the system. And part of the problem was the city didn't bother to upgrade. They didn't bother to maintain. And part of that is because they stopped collecting payments. The politicians did not want the voters to be mad at them. So the voters, when they stopped paying their water bills, they kept getting water. There was no incentive for them to pay the water bill. It is a system of mismanagement, of misuse, of neglect, of of decrepit systems, of failures to upgrade. It's like the power system in California. They failed to maintain the lines, they failed to upgrade the lines, and the power goes out now when it gets too hot or if it gets too cold. Well, I say we're talking about a cult because the Washington Post has an entirely different take on it. Here's the headline. Again, I think it's important for you to understand the reason Jackson, Mississippi is having a water crisis that has become national news is because the city bungled it. It mismanaged it. It didn't reinvest in it. It didn't upgrade it. The whole system deteriorated over decades. They never upgraded it. They never moved it to higher ground. They never collected payments from customers. They never did anything they needed to do. You know, I live in Macon, Georgia. Back in 1994, there's a hurricane, became a tropical storm, and it flooded Georgia. It was a terrible flood. It was like a 500-year flood. I know people whose houses washed away, who weren't even in floodplains. The water rose so high. And the water treatment facility at the time was in a place that was right along a river. The water rose up so high, it wiped out the water treatment facility. So what did they do? They moved it to higher ground. Made a lot of sense to do. Jackson, Mississippi has never done that. The Pearl River hasn't been dredged in decades. It used to not flood as badly as it does now, and that flooding has a lot to do with the lack of dredging of the river over over decades. Well, according to the Washington Post, here's the headline. Jackson, Mississippi shows how extreme weather can trigger a clean water crisis. That's right. Climate change is to blame for the Jackson, Mississippi water system. The water crisis unfolding in Mississippi's capital this week has forced schools to shift virtual learning, led to widespread distribution of bottled water and left Jackson's mostly black population without adequate pressure to reliably flush toilets or fight fires. The crumbling water infrastructure in Jackson, where roughly 150,000 residents were under a boil water notice even before heavy rainfall and river flooding overwhelmed the system, has been plagued by decades of underinvestment and deterred deferred maintenance. But it also portends what could soon happen in other communities as climate change's worsening impacts push under-resourced and overburdened water systems to the brink. This is a cult. This is a cult. When everything is about climate change, nothing is about climate change. They admit at the beginning that it has to do with underfunded, corrupt, neglected system, and then, but it's actually about climate change. The Pearl River went past flood stage, but it is notable the Pearl River did not rise as high as they thought it was going to rise. It didn't hit the level they expected it to hit. In the Pearl River, what the article doesn't really get into has not been adequately dredged. The Pearl River used to get dredged. They don't do that anymore. That has nothing to do with climate change. The Pearl River, I'm from that area of the country. There is a lot of rain. I'm from South Louisiana. I don't care where you live in the United States. You don't have storms like I grew up with in South Louisiana. They are a unique phenomenon. Maybe parts of South Florida have these sorts of thunderstorms, but they are unique. They come up on you. They are very strong. They produce a lot of hail and wind and dump a ton of water. They're called gully washers. And they've happened there for decades. They still happen. It's not a function of climate change. It's a function of where you live in the country. To say that this is a climate change problem and to try to make it a climate change problem is to make it not 
ever about climate change. Hurricane Danielle has just formed. It is now September. August of 2022 was the first time in 25 years that there were no hurricanes in the Atlantic. They were predicting because of climate change, we would have all of these storms this year. It turns out the Atlantic is cooler than expected, and this hurricane formed further north than expected because the area where the hurricanes usually form is cooler. You know what they're saying? It's climate change. It's always climate change. They tell us with these computer models how things are going to go, and when those things don't pan out, they say, well, it's climate change. And if it does pan out, it's climate change. It's always climate change. If everything is climate change, nothing is climate change. It is a cult. I'm one of those people who is willing to believe that, yes, the world generally is heating up. We can argue about whether it's human or natural. We can argue about these things. We can also argue about how many of the temperature records are in urban areas when they used to be in rural areas, but because of the, the, the amount of concrete and asphalt, it's affected the temperature record. But we can go to satellites. We can go to oceans. But you can't really believe these people anymore, can you? Because so much of it is cult-like. And now they arrive at Jackson, Mississippi, a place where even they have to concede has a lot to do with mismanagement, and other issues, and yet they pull a climate change story out of it. These people are in a cult, and I'm not sure why we need to take people in a cult seriously. They don't want to take Christians seriously, and Christians are in an organized 2,000-year-old religion with a, an orthodoxy, a dogma, a systematic theology, and it all makes sense when put together. It makes way more sense as a whole life view than the climate change arguments do, and yet they don't want to take Christians seriously. I'm not sure why we should take any of these people seriously. When everything is about climate change, everything, when that just means nothing is. Now, I'm promising phone calls. I do want to spend the rest of the hour on phone calls. The phone number is 877-973-7425. A lot of people still want to weigh in on the speech and the like. I want to actually take a wild card topic here with Adam before we go back to everybody else. Adam, welcome to the show. Hey, Mr. Erickson. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, and I may not be tying these together correctly, but that's all right. It's not climate abortion. change, is it? <laughs> no, sir. It, it's in regards to abortion. Uh -huh. um, on these random acts, you hear occasionally of a pregnant lady getting killed, and then the person getting charged with their murder and the unborn child's murder. How does that not set some kind of precedence of? life actually does exist in the world. Oh, you're asking a very dangerous question there, Adam. Um, because it, under the default standards, even in a lot of states that are big proponents of abortion, if a mother dies while pregnant, the mother is presumed to have made the choice that that child is a human being. Therefore, we have to treat the child as a human being because the mother did not kill the child. Um, that is their logic. Um, as opposed to, well, obviously the child's life has meaning because the child is is conceived, is growing in the womb, is therefore a human being, even if not in a viable form yet, uh, it is a human being. And the, the pro-abortion states would say that's not really it. What happened is there is this magical miracle moment where the mother decided that she wanted to keep the child, and by deciding to keep the child, that's how the child somehow has meaning and is a human being, as opposed to, well, it's just the science and biology of it. Again, I, I, listen, I, I, we're not going to go theology here, but, you know, Christianity has a comprehensive worldview that has answers to all of these questions. And progressivism deeply contradicts itself. You're born gay or straight, but you get to decide if you're a boy or a girl. None of this sort of stuff makes sense these days, uh, but it's what the left believes, and it's all deeply contradictory. So you're born gay or straight, um, but wait, you're, you're born that way, but so you're conceived and something happens in the womb, but you're not really a human being until you leave the womb. And, and then it was already predetermined. At what point was it predetermined? Was it while you were halfway out of the womb? It doesn't make any sense. And they don't care as long as you're bullied into believing what they think. And that's part of the problem here. You can tell us a deeply inconsistent worldview because you've got to be bullied into believing it.
Everybody asked me about bowl and branch sheets. I actually put up a picture the other day. We got some at our house because we order from them. We actually are customers. They're like, oh my gosh, are they really that good? Yes, they get softer every single time you wash them. I mean, they use 100% organic cotton threads. They're super soft. You get such a good sleep. They have just the great weight to them. Like I had a pair of sheets we actually threw away when we replaced them with bowl and branch where is they were just like too light and also not very soft. The bowl and branch, they're perfect. The drape across your body when you sleep, absolutely perfect. Bowl and branch uses the highest quality threads on earth for superior softness, for a better night's sleep. They've got over 10,000 stellar reviews. Their signature sheets come in nine neutral colors in all sizes from twin to California King. You will feel the difference. And they're 100% free from toxins. No pesticides, no formaldehyde, no harsh chemicals. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code ERIC, E-R-I-C-K, at BolandBranch.com. That's BolandBranch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, Branch.com. The promo code is ERIC, E-R-I-C-K. This hour of the program brought to you by First Liberty Building and Loan. They are in Noonan, Georgia, but it doesn't matter if you're in the United States. They can help your business grow. If you want to buy a building, build a building, buy a franchise, expand a franchise, reach out to them. $750,000 loans and up. That's what they specialize in. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. Tell them I sent you. To the phones, uh, listen, um, we are about a half hour until I can fire up a cigar on my front porch I would love to spend this time with you guys, 877-973-7425. We all might as well enjoy our holiday weekend together here. Uh, happy to take your calls, and I want to go next to Sharon. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm doing really good for our Friday. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, I loved how Trump stood up to the media. That made me so happy. But I love also how he showed us that there are possibilities. But now I want more. I want a leader who can take the PC BS and put it on the back burner and start dealing with real issues for every American, not just groups here and there. I want a strong leader. That's it. Yes. Okay. So when you're looking forward in the lay of the land, who are you looking at? I'll be honest with you. I think the landscape is pretty bare. Yeah. I, I mean, I, if Trump is the nominee, uh, of course, I will vote for Trump. But like I said, I think I want someone even stronger. Mm -hmm. I want someone who can stand up to all of these chattering voices and say, no, we're going to, we're going to talk about real issues. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people that aren't surviving right now, the people that are struggling right now, we're going to do, we're going to fix those things first mm -hmm. and then deal with, you know, all the other stuff. Right. And okay, then, that, I don't, well, I don't, I really, I haven't sense. seen. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I, I, I was, given what you're saying, I, I actually was expecting you to, to, to say DeSantis or Holly or someone like that. Uh, you still got several years to be able to vet these candidates. I, I will tell you, I'm going to have them all in Atlanta next year uh, on stage with me answering questions and talking about these sorts of issues as, as we chart a path forward. I, I, I just, I distinctly think, Sharon, it would be a really bad idea for Republicans to go backwards in order to go forward. Uh, bring in someone fresh who's guaranteed to get eight years almost. I shouldn't say guaranteed, but pretty close. If you go with Trump, he only has four years. And I know there are people who say, well, what about a Trump DeSantis ticket? Well, the Constitution prohibits that. Uh, the Constitution actually does. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who didn't know this. I shouldn't say it prohibits it. Here's what happens. Under the American Constitution, if two individuals from the same state run for president and vice president as a ticket, so your president is from Florida and your vice presidential nominee is from Florida, Florida is prohibited from having its Electoral College votes counted. So you start at a 30, what is it, 30, 30, is it, no, 30, 31, 32 um, deficit. You, you start at a deficit of about 30 electoral college votes, which in a closely divided country is not uh, surmountable. 
So if Trump and DeSantis, Trump's moved his residency to Florida, if Trump and DeSantis were to run together in 2024, as a lot of people have said they should, you automatically take at minimum 30 votes out of the Electoral College for them. You still have to get to 270 to win, but you're minus those 30. I don't know that Republicans want to do that. Uh, it doesn't seem smart to me um, to be able to do that. Um, but some people have said it. I just think, and then Trump only gets four years. There's no guarantee then. DeSantis would have to build. If Trump's a disaster as president, if people get turned off by him again, uh, well, then that puts DeSantis down, and then you get another Democrat, as opposed to you just go with a DeSantis or a Nikki Haley or a Tom, Tim Scott or a Tom Cotton or somebody, and at least probably get them eight years. All right, 877-973-7425. More of your calls when we come back. Yes, you can. And I would like to spend this half hour on your phone calls and hope everyone has a very safe holiday. Let us return to the calls. I'm going to go next to Alan. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. I've uh, I really enjoyed it today. Uh, I'll get right to the point because I know you have a lot of callers. But what, what Biden did was he just said to Republicans, MAGA Republicans in the, in the range, that they're, they're deplorables, just like Hillary. But the problem is, when Trump was in, he got results. Look at the results we've got over the past few years. High inflation, Afghanistan, the border. It's like Chinese water torture that keeps drip, drip, dripping only it's costing us internationally and financially, you know, costing people personally, financially. And they're bumping up. Biden has created a circumstance where we can't afford the answers that he's giving us, even if in the long term, get, get off oil, you know, and, and the benefits of that environmentally. But it's long term. You just can't cram it down people's throats because it's a process not an event mm -hmm. you know and then and then you think like he's in a bad spot politically you know lincoln was in a bad spot the whole time and we're talking you know every 80 85 years this country struggles for its survival you know the foundation the civil you know the, our creation the civil war uh world war ii and the depression and now it seems like it's another another time that's that's come up again but, but you can't, you know, Lincoln had finesse. Even Trump had a little bit of finesse. Biden doesn't appear to have any, you would think, as a vice president <laughs> for yeah, eight you years. You would think. Under, for eight years, he'd learn something from Obama. Obama Listen, could be. Uh, here's the problem with Joe Biden. He had a reputation for 50 years in Washington, D.C. of never learning anything. Uh, he came in with ideas, and despite any of it that contradicted those events, he refused to change his mind. It was one of the problems with the Afghanistan situation. Joe Biden went into Afghanistan, was told by all of the generals, you can't leave the way you want to leave. There are ways to leave, but not this way, and he didn't care. He did not care. Joe Biden very famously, very famously, um wanted to cut Iraq into three portions and have them each be three separate countries. And every single expert told him that would not work and would provoke further war. And he did not care at all. Just flat out did not care. Um, he, he never learns anything. He never listens to anyone. Um, and that's the biggest problem with Joe Biden's presidency. And he's got Ron Klain there who affirms every one of his decisions and never tries to steer him in a different direction. Uh, Ron Klain is as much a problem here, and his fingerprints were all over that speech last night. And I'm glad he gave the speech he gave last night. I'm actually genuinely glad Joe Biden gave the speech last night. I'm I, as, as a partisan Republican, I think the speech was good for the GOP. It allows the GOP to move forward. Now, I, I got I to gotta play this audio real quick. Because uh, Michael Beschloss is one of the historians who Joe Biden listens to regularly. And he was on TV uh, before the speech yesterday, and he said this. I said, and the others said, I'm happy to be 
transparent about it to President Biden in the map room, uh, this is like 1860. This is like 1940. You know, you have to talk about the large issue in the room. And just as, as Lincoln gave the House divided speech, just as Roosevelt gave a speech on the State of the Union about the four freedoms, as you well know, 1941, you know, here is the time when President Biden has chosen. And by the way, we didn't help him write this speech. I don't give political advice, nor did any of the rest of us. And good thing, it would be pretty sad because we're not equipped to do that. But the point is that he realized that this is an historic moment. And what you what you heard, I think, comes out of it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, listen to this also from Beschloss. Here we're in a situation where, you know, we're talking about historical parallels. Uh, in 1860, we were on the precipice of civil war, very different from where we are in 2022, but this specter of looming violence. 1940, world violence. Would uh, the United States enter World War II to oppose Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and the Imperial Japanese? I'm not suggesting that this year is the equivalent except for in one respect. And that is if you know a historian from 50 years from now were to go back and visit America in, the 20, in 2022, the overwhelming question is, are we gonna have a democracy in a year or two? Are we gonna have free and fair elections with all those state officials and state legislatures threatening to say, we're going to just name the winner whoever we feel like are we going to have rule of law you know take a look at what yep. happened at mar-a-lago so those questions are hanging in the balance and to have a president saying that this election this year is about anything but the survival of democracy you'd wonder where he was yeah so he can he can deny all he wants that he had a hand in the speech and that's fine but it was his words and his advice to Joe Biden that helped Joe Biden shape this. And remember, Beschloss is one of the historians who told Joe Biden to go big or go home with his agenda and has has been to blame for a lot of what he did that he did wrong. I'm happy with these people advising Joe Biden in this regard because I really, really do think that it winds up blowing up in the Democrats' face and the Republicans have two months to get momentum back on their side. Uh, Cheryl, you're going to be up next on the Eric Erickson Show. Welcome. Hi, Eric. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I've been listening to you talk about, you know, we need to make sure the next election is not about Donald Trump. I agree with that. Um, I've donated money to Herschel Walker, and it, when I wrote my check, I put a note in there, stay away from Donald Trump. Um I agree totally with Trump's policies that he implemented when he was in office. As far as his policies go, I'm behind him 100%. But he's a narcissistic, uh, childish brat in his behavior. And I, and I also agree with you. I think that's primarily the reason he lost. He can't, he can't uh, convince people who are in the middle to vote for him. Um, so my question is, how can we convince people such as a Ron DeSantis or Tim Scott and those kind of people to uh, be willing to run against him um, in 2024? Um, how do we convince the people at the top of the Republican Party to basically tell Trump to back off and, and let's let somebody who has a chance of winning go for it? I honestly, truly believe that they're going to run anyway. Um, I'm not convinced he's going to, you know, there were all these reports he may run, uh, he may announce before the midterm election. And now the reports are coming out that, that he's reconsidering things. I, maybe he will. I got it wrong in 2016. I didn't think he'd actually pull the trigger and he did. Uh, and, and he wound up winning and I don't, I, I you can't predict the man, but I just no. don't think he's going to. Uh, have the cakewalk that he does. The only concern I have is if you have a million Republicans run again, like in 2016. Keep in mind, the thing about Donald Trump getting the Republican nomination in 2016 is that he did it with the fewest votes cast for the nominee ever. Mitt Romney got like 
percent of the Republican Party vote in 2012 to be the GOP nominee. Donald Trump only got 42 percent, but there were so many people running, he was able to to do it. I I don't think that dynamic is going to exist in 2024. You'll also potentially have a two-term governor in Florida who's very popular. You'll have a a senator from South Carolina and a governor from South South Carolina, both very popular, and others running. Uh, some of whom worked for him, you'll also probably have Mike Pence run. And I don't know that Pence is running to win as so much as to run to call out Trump. Uh, it's it's a kind of an odd thing that that Pence is doing. I'm, I'm intrigued by what he's doing. I don't know that he's even going to run. He's surrounded himself with a team that looks like he's going to run, though. Um, it's, it's not going to be the same dynamic as 2016. You're going to have a number of people who carry his message but have better win records than he does. Um, it's no longer really about Donald Trump. It's about Trump's changes to the GOP and who can best preserve and maintain and advance those changes in a smart fashion moving forward and win two terms as opposed to just one. Philip, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show, Philip. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Hey, I got one question. Yet the Dem- uh, Republicans, they just do not. I don't know. I just don't think they understand about the abortion law that it was the Democrats that caused that with the Mississippi law, which had a 15 weeks. And they the one took it to the court for the. Uh, yeah, the, the decision. Overturned. Yeah. And but I don't hear none of the none of the uh, Republicans that's running for anything on any state or any war talking about it. They just let the. Republic or Democrat just rub it in their face. Hey, the, you know, I, you, I gotta you, say, uh, I, 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 Philip, I really actually am convinced that re, even though the Dobbs decision was leaked and they should have known it was coming, I really do think Republicans were caught flat footed when the decision actually came out. Uh, the Democrats were to a degree as well, but Democrats leapt into the breach and really tried to define it in ways. I just, Republicans seemed ill prepared for that decision to come out. And they should have been able to, to to articulate a reasonable response, the reasonable response particularly being that, you know, it was the Democrats who overplayed their hand here and got this result in the court. They knew it was coming. And also, all the pro-life movement wanted was to be able to allow this to be decided at Democratic level, at the state level. And now we get that opportunity and we'll win some and we'll lose some. We just wanted the right to have the conversation. And that's what they got out of Dobbs. And they could have been able to make that case. Uh, Jeannie, you are next. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Um, well, I'm lucky enough that I'm in that uh, middle age group now that I was looking at the AMAC, uh, the alternative to AARP, right. and just wanted your thoughts on it. Uh, I actually like AMAC. Uh, I know the people behind it. I will tell you they are not uh, as large or taken seriously by politicians as the AARP, which despite being a left-leaning organization, pretends to be very middle of the road. They're not really, they're pretty aggressively on the left these days. Uh, AMAC, as opposed, is an explicitly conservative organization for seniors who don't like the AARP, uh, who want an organization that can actually advocate for conservative policy that'll benefit senior citizens. I like them. Uh, I used to have a, a pretty good working relationship with them years ago before I got in talk radio. I knew the folks there, went to some of their meetings, talked about public policy. Uh, they really are a fairly explicitly conservative group, which hinders their ability to help with policy in Washington. The AARP, essentially, if you turn 50 years old, Uh, You are a member of the AARP. You you get the car. They have a huge fundraising budget. They start sending you crap in the mail whether you want to be a part of them or not. And then they use that giving you membership to say we represent the most senior citizens in this country and they all want progressivism, which is nonsense. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the AARP. Uh, AMAC, you have to explicitly go out. You join uh, and they advance policy. What gives them credibility with Republicans, though, is that you have to want to be a member of as opposed to AARP just signing you up. I'll tell you another group you should be a member of and sign up for is actually become a customer of Patriot Mobile because they advance the conservative movement and they do it quite well. They take a portion of their profits and they contribute to the conservative causes you care about, whether it's the Second Amendment or the uh, gun rights movement in the country, or that is Second Amendment, or, or the pro-life cause. They really support conservative causes. They also 
are getting into supporting really good conservative candidates around the country. And the way they do it is they take a portion of their profits and they contribute it to the cause. They need you as a customer, obviously, to grow those profits to be able to do it. And I hope you'll consider moving your cell service to them. They can take your existing number or they can take a, give you a brand new number. They use the same cell towers everybody else uses, so you get guaranteed great service. You don't have to believe me on that. If you go to their website, you can put in your home address and you can see down to your house how good the service is. 5G, data, 4G, you name it. They, they Again, they use the same cell towers everybody else does. They get guaranteed great service. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric. That's patriotmobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. Uh, you can sign up for them there, or you can call them if you want to do it on the phone, 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. You're not calling somebody in Mumbai or Bangladesh. You're calling somebody in the United States. They have 100% U.S.-based customer service, Then they're Christian conservatives. You're not doing business with the wokes. You're doing business with conservatives. It's patriotmobile.com slash Eric or 972-PATRIOT. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here. No reason to give you the phone number now. We don't have a ton of time left. I, I want to comment on something. John Harwood is out at CNN. Uh, I am intrigued by this new guy running the shop over there. Here's the problem with John Harwood. John Harwood is a progressive. He is open about his progressive beliefs. He was at CNBC and the New York Times for a good while. He was one of the people who participated in a CNBC debate of the GOP and discredited himself in the process by his openly partisan disdain of the GOP while on stage at that debate. And then he got hired by CNN, and he was hired to be an aggressive political analyst. The man is a progressive. Like Jeffrey Tubin, who was also out at CNN, Jeffrey Tubin was hired by CNN to be their objective legal analyst, and the man is a pure partisan hack. He doesn't like Republicans. He doesn't like conservatives. He doesn't like conservative justices on the court, and he's now out at CNN. And I want to be very clear with all of you. The problem is not that Jeffrey Tubin or John Harwood are progressives. Listening to progressives talk about John Harwood leaving or even Tubin before that, Mourning the loss of these two guys and their voices should tell you everything you need to know about progressive left. But the problem is not that they were progressive. The problem is that they held themselves out to not be progressive when everyone clearly could see that they were progressive. From their offline statements to their writings elsewhere, they clearly are in a love affair with the Democratic Party and the progressive left. So it's discrediting to CNN to have people on their network who claim to be objective, who are open partisans offline. There are a lot of really good people at CNN. Some of you get mad at me for praising the network on occasion or talking about the network. I used to work there. I have a lot of good friends there. Roger Ailes rescued me from the network. Uh, I got a job at Fox for five years. I actually have as many friends from three years at CNN as I do at Fox. Uh, there are some really good, hardworking journalists there. Some of the people you don't like, I actually know them behind the scenes and, and really have great friendships with them. Some of them are on the left. Some of them try very hard to compensate uh, for their worldview, and they try to be fair. I think it's notable that when a Republican is in the White House, Republicans hate Jake Tapper. And when a Democrat's there, it's Democrats who hate Jake Tapper. He tries to ask tough questions, even if his worldview, he and I may not always align on stuff. But a guy like Harwood was a bridge too far. A guy like Don Lemon is a bridge too far. Can't keep waiting to find out his contract's not going to be renewed. Uh, Don Lemon goes out of his way to be a progressive on CNN. And Jeff Zucker allowed these people to be uh, belligerently progressive and belligerently aggressively uh, against Republicans. To see Chris Cuomo now at News Nation, full disclosure, I'm on Leland Vittert's show on News Nation uh, a couple of times a month. I like Leland Vittert. He was at Fox. He's trying to play it straight. They don't do the double talking heads yelling at each other. They'll take a, the conservative and then they'll take the progressive and they'll have a separate conversation with each to have Chris Cuomo uh, try to rebrand himself as not a progressive is absurd to me. After giving him so much time on CNN to be that way, I just, look, if I were to go, I can be objective. And I try to, at times, like the start of the show today, just call it straight. But you know where I stand. You know I'm a conservative. You know uh, my view is, is to the right of, of where a lot of people in the media are. 
They would never allow me to even pretend to be objective, and yet the media keeps allowing these progressives to pretend to be objective. And that ultimately is why so many people do not trust the media in America anymore. I'm glad CNN's cleaning up its act. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.